Kurnazale uh, is this amazing figure that we've been puzzling over all those years. And thank goodness he didn't wait till 2011 to say who he was. Some of us might have been dead by then. That's too late. I want to know this side of the kingdom, who is this amazing fellow who's come to the unity of God? So what I want to give him time to do is to share his amazing story. Will you come forward, please? Come inside. Thank you. publicly speak on this subject. I'm the pro from the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that was my nickname on the PGA Tour. I played on the PGA Tour and the Senior Champions Tour 30 years full time. In my first year on the tour, I was interviewed with Jack Nicholas by Bob Hope at the Bob Hope Desert Classic in Palm Springs, California because Jack and I had played together in the last round. And as we finished the 18th hole, we're walking to the back of the green. The big television tower was on the back behind the green, and Bob Hope was up there commentating. And he came down and out of the tower because of Jack, of course. Bob interviewed us, and he says, Kermit Zarley, with a name like that, you sound like you must be the pro from the moon. <laughs> And so the media really picked up on that, and so I became known as the Moon Pro. <laughs> I had a little bit of success on the tour. I won five times. Two of them were unofficial. I finished second or tied for second 15 times. And so, you know, I had a so-so career, had some success. I never did win a major championship, which was my goal, and uh, it was to win the U.S. Open. And that was, uh, I had my chance, 1972. I was uh, leading Jack Nicklaus, in fact, uh, by a stroke, in well into the front nine on the seventh hole. I three-putted from about 20 feet. And on the eighth hole, I three-putted from six feet. Oh. <laughs> and I came around to the 14th hole, dog leg right, par five, and I had to wedge the green on my third shot. I plugged it in the front bunker right beside the pin and made an eight. Oh, we call that a snowman. My dad had flown down from Seattle just to watch me in the last round. And he said, when I saw you make that eight on number 14, I turned green. <laughs> and that figures, you know, we're both named Kermit. I'm a junior. <laughs> Kermit the Frog, you know. <laughs> and so uh, he said, you spent more money in one minute than I make in a year. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was a hot dog pro, you know. That's where you're playing in a threesome on the tour, and a couple of guys are in your gallery, and one of them says to his friend, uh, who's playing in this group? And the other guy says, uh, Kermit Zarley. And the first guy says, ah, oh, let's get a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are at this theological conference in Atlanta, Georgia. So I used to come here every year and play in the Atlantic Classic. And then when I got on the senior tour, of course, I would come here and play in the tournament on the senior tour. And uh, I always look forward to coming here to Atlanta. Special people here in Georgia and the Carolinas. I just really enjoy people here. Lots of good people, a lot of Christians. This is the heart of the Bible Belt. I can tell you lots of stories about the tour just right here in Atlanta, but we don't have time for it. But I'll tell you about one of my favorite people. I had a goal, one of my goals in my life was to meet Billy Graham. And it started when I was eight years old. Because I was born and raised in Seattle, and my mother, when Billy had a crusade in Seattle in 1949, I was eight years old, and she took, she wanted to go hear Billy. And she took me. And so, uh, as Billy got to the end of his message, my mother started crying. And I had never seen that very often from my mother. And I thought to myself, when I grow up, 
I want to find out what that man is saying that made my mother cry. Mm. Later on, I, I became a Christian when I was 13 years old and, uh, and had an interest in meeting Billy even more. And so I met Billy right here in Atlanta on the uh, putting green at Atlantic Country Club. And uh, I must say, Billy has one bad habit that I know of. He played golf cross-handed. <laughs> you know, it's all right to putt cross-handed, but don't hit your full shots that way. You're going to break an arm. <laughs> and Billy, he, he told me about it. He said, I have tried and tried to go to the regular way to play golf. You know, this way, with your right hand below your your left for a right-handed golfer. He says, I just can't do it. And his own pro up at Montreat would give him golf lessons and try to convert him. And the pro would convert Billy Graham. <laughs> but uh, I knew something wasn't quite right about Billy. You know, I thought, Billy's just got everything right. Well, not quite. When he first met me, he called me Zermit three times. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and Billy endorsed my second book. I uh, was really privileged about that and uh, grateful. And then we wound up starting this ministry on the PJ Tour called the PJ Tour Bible Study. And eventually we got Billy to come speak to our group, which he did three times. But there was another time that he spoke to the tour that was even before that. And uh, we had a evangelistic banquet for all of the tour players in Atlantic Classic at the Marriott Hotel and almost all of them came. The invitation went out from Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, and Gary Player. And so I sat uh, at the banquet with, beside Jack Nicholas. The next time that Billy spoke to us was at our private PJ Tour Bible Club the next uh, year. And I introduced Billy. And I told a story on him that he didn't know. People often ask me, did you play the Masters? Because here we are now in Georgia. The Masters is right up the street, Augusta, Georgia. Well, yes, I played six times in the Masters. And the first year I played, I stayed at a private home, which I didn't do very much on the tour. And uh, the man's name who owned the home was Mr. Whitney. And he was the great-great-great-grandson of Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin. <laughs> and so Mr. Whitney, had uh, he was a devout Christian man. He had a theological library in his house. I think that's where I got the idea that I wanted to have a theological library in my home somewhere. But at any rate, Mr. Whitney told me a story on Billy. And this is the story that I told years later when I introduced Billy to our group. Some Christian businessmen in the city of Augusta decided that they wanted to hold an evangelistic Christian crusade for the city. And they selected a committee of men to uh, choose the evangelist. And Mr. Whitney was on the committee. It was three men. And so they would meet various times. They would interview evangelists. They interviewed Billy Graham. So it came time for them to vote who they were going to choose. And the two other gentlemen voted for this young Billy Graham, who had just graduated from college, was just starting in his career. And Mr. Whitney said, Billy Graham? He won't amount to nothing but a country preacher. <laughs> so Billy didn't know that story. And so he got up and he said, Mr. Whitney was exactly right. I'm nothing but a country preacher. <laughs> and that's what I like so much about Billy Graham. Humble man. Well, that's enough reminiscing. Let's get to why it is I'm here today. I wrote this book, The Restitution of Jesus Christ published in 2008 electronically. I uh, couldn't get a publisher to take it on, so I was doing this self-publishing. The next year we decided, no, let's make a book. So we went ahead and made a book, made a website. The website that you can get the book at is Servetus or Servetus, the evangelical.com. 
because Servetus the Evangelical is my pseudonym for this book. And I was not telling anybody who I was. In fact, I came to this opinion many, many years ago and I kept it very secret. I didn't want people to know about it. You know, unorthodox, persecution, and so forth. And so I did it with this pseudonym and I had a contest on the website uh, trying to guess who I am. And it was starting a buzz and Anthony uh, found out about it and he was emailing me and said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I had some people really fooled. <laughs> you know, I told them, uh, yeah, I was giving these clues every month and towards the end I started giving them every week. And the clues I had said, well, I got a PhD. So a lot of people were there, ah, this guy, he must be some scholar. You know, maybe he's famous, Anthony was thinking. But, you know, nobody asked me, hey, is that an honorary PhD? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, no, I don't have an earned PhD. In fact, I don't really have any formal theological training. But I've been a very, very serious student of the Bible now for 50 years. And so that's what I'd like to get to. Uh, I was going to reveal my identity as Servetus the Evangelical in 2011 on September 29th. Why? That's when Michael Servetus, who I took my pseudonym from, uh, Michael Servetus was born in 1511 on September 29th. That happens to be Michael Mass Day. Does anybody know what Michael Mass Day is? In medieval times, for many centuries, the Catholic Church had a holiday called Michael Mass Day. They honored Michael the Archangel, and they called him Saint Michael, which I don't think is quite right. <laughs> but at any rate, they honored uh, Michael the Archangel. And uh, he was the patron saint of police departments, fire departments, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then I found out there was a tradition that people would cook a goose on Michael Mass Day and eat it. Well, anyway, uh, he was, uh, Michael Servetus was uh, executed, burnt the stake, 1553, and it was John Calvin and the pastors of Geneva who were responsible for this. The great Bible teacher, John Calvin. Uh, Michael Servetus had written a book when he was 20 years old on the heirs of the Trinity. And then he went into hiding, changed his name, became a medical doctor, wrote books, and he wrote about the uh, circulation of blood over 100 years before it was discovered in medicine. A brilliant man. But uh, he was very much against infant baptism and the doctrine of the Trinity. So he finally wrote another book called The Restitution of Christianity. And that's where I take my title, The Restitution of Jesus Christ, from. So both my pseudonym and the title mm. come from Servetus. Mm. And so he was executed in 1553. And I was going to reveal my identity on the 500th anniversary of his birth. But in the meantime, I came up with an invention called The Triangle Book, and I decided I'm going to make this book, The Restitution of Jesus Christ, in this triangle book format, which I did. And, uh, and so we came out with that a few months ago. Incidentally, I only brought a few of those books, and I noticed they're already gone, and I discounted them at $30 each. So if anybody wants a book, didn't get one, you can go to my website, just put a note on there to my daughter, my webmaster, and say, hey, I was at this conference. Would you sell me that book for $30? And we'll do that for you. But at any rate, I had to go ahead and reveal my identity early because my patent attorney said, hey, it's going to cost you a bunch of money and trouble to uh, continue this business of anonymity about this book. And so I said, I ah, forget it. <laughs> and so I went ahead and revealed my identity on November 19th, the day before I went to the Society of Biblical Literature's annual meeting. Uh, I'm a member of that the last 10 years, and it's a highlight of my year to go to that every year. And when I did, 200 websites said, hey, this guy's a, some golf pro nobody heard of. <laughs> You're right, I'm a hot dog pro. <laughs> 
But uh, let me just briefly uh, tell you my story. It starts in Seattle. I was born there. My parents, I uh, didn't come from a religious home, but they had respect for Christianity because they grew up in church-going families themselves. And so my, I had two uncles that were pastors in the Nazarene church. And one of them started pastoring a church one mile from my house when I was five years old. And so my mother sent me off to Sunday school there. And I grew up going to Sunday school and getting all the gold stars for never missing and all that stuff. And then when I was 13 years old, my Sunday school teacher at the time, Gordy, was a student at the University of Washington. And apparently he'd been tra uh, trained by navigators because he had us memorize 10 verses in the Bible. And especially one of them got my attention, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved, through faith, not of works, it's not of yourselves, uh, lest any man should boast. And that got my attention. I had a discussion with him privately. I said, I thought that you go to heaven just by being good. No, uh, Jesus died on the cross for a reason. And so and I came to understand more the Christian gospel right then with Gordy. And then the verse, uh, Revelation 3.20, Jesus speaking, the heavenly Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, sup with him, he with me. That's what I did with Gordy in private prayer. I accepted Jesus into my life. And I believe he came into my life and I was born again when I was 13 years old. My bar missed. <laughs> and so and then, four years later, I went to college, way down in Houston, because it was the great golf dynasty that was developing. They won the, six, the NC2A championship 16 times in just over 30 years with the same coach, Dave Williams, a Christian man, who when I first came to school, he told us, boys, go to the church of your choice. And that had an influence on me. So right away, I uh, started going to a church, a Bible church, very serious about the Bible at this place. Uh, Chuck Swindle and Hal Lindsey came from this church. And the uh, pastor taught the Bible every evening, hour and 15 minutes. Uh, he had an overhead projector, a screen up here, he scribbled and wrote on this thing all the time. He'd be giving us the Hebrew and the Greek all the time in the Bible. And so this was quite an experience, like a mini seminary. I also got involved with Campus Crusade for Christ. Uh, athletes were meeting together in the athletic dorm for prayer and Bible study. So I got involved in this. And that's when I was, uh, began to grow as a Christian. Then I, uh, I went on the tour in 1964. 1965, I co-founded the PGA Tour Bible Study with my best friend, uh, Babe Hiskey. And uh, that ministry eventually proliferated onto all of the major golf tours all around the world. Ladies tour here in the U.S., various different tours. Somebody asked me about uh, Bernard Langer this morning. Uh, Bernard Langer. Uh, came to the Lord in the PGA Tour Bible study here on the tour, and then he decided, uh, he continued to play some tournaments on the European Tour. He says, I want to start one of these on the European Tour, which he did. Uh, went to the South African Tour and all over. And eventually, other ministries in golf developed. Golf Fellowship, College Golf Fellowship, a Lynx Letter Magazine, and uh, lots of different things. And so the, the one thing that I, I really get out of that is Jesus' parable that all we need is faith like a tiny mustard seed. And that's what we had when we started out. And God will grow that. And just think of ourselves as even though we're fallen creatures, God wants to use us if we will just turn to Him by faith and repentance and make ourselves available, he's liable to just use us in a way that we would have never expected. Yeah. Like in my case, I never, never would have expected I would have ever become an author. <laughs> and now I got six books. But uh, I got out on the tour and 
I had been taught the doctrine of the Trinity way back when I was 17, 18 years old. My church and I believed it for 20 years. You know, I don't think I really believed it because of what I read in the Bible. It was more that, you know, I was a young person in Christ. I need someone to teach me, and so I was getting this teaching, and it became ingrained in me. But there was a prayer that was my main prayer throughout my life from the time of my early 20s, and that was... You know, I looked around and I saw, you know, there's all these religions in the world. And then within my religion of Christianity, there's all these denominations. And so there's all this disagreement, you know, this thing, that thing. And so, you know, I said to myself, hey, how can I expect that I've got the truth and everybody else that disagrees with me is wrong? <laughs> Maybe I've got some things that I believe that aren't right either. So I started praying, and I made this the main prayer in my life. God, if I believe something that is not true, please show me. And so I, uh, truth was what I sought after, the truth of God. That was what was most important to me, was to know God's truth. And so here I was about 1979 or 1980, and I was reading in my Bible. I had never met a Unitarian. I frankly didn't care about meeting a Unitarian. <laughs> because what I knew about Unitarians was that they're all Universalists, and they don't believe in the atonement of Christ on the cross. And so I don't want anything to do with those people. But in about 1979 or 80, I had my personal Bible study, and I was reading Jesus' Olivet Discourse. I had made a commitment to God in prayer. In fact, in an all-night prayer vigil, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ retreat during my, uh, the break of my freshman year in college. And so I, I made this promise before all of these uh, college guys I, I said, and to God, I said, I'm going to seriously study Bible prophecy the rest of my life. And so now out of my six books, three of them are on Bible prophecy. And so uh, I was reading in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, and in Matthew 24, verse 36, and Mark 13, verse 32, Jesus is speaking of his second coming, and he says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, referring to himself, only the Father. And all of a sudden, <laughs> that woke me up. And I thought, what? <laughs> Jesus is saying he doesn't know the time of his second coming? <laughs> Jesus is God. He certainly does know the time of his second coming. Now I had, I had also been taught the hypostatic union. That means that Jesus has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. And what I was taught, and many Christians are, is that when we read in the Bible and the Gospels about the deeds and the words of Jesus, that sometimes he said or did these things out of one of his natures and not the other one. And that was the only explanation that they could come up with in order to protect their doctrine that Jesus is both man and God. And so I've been taught that Jesus said this in his human nature, meaning he did not know the time of his second coming in his human nature. But since he's God, he certainly does know the time of his second coming in his divine nature. And of course, we're talking about something that's going to happen in the future. And so, I thought for the first time in my life, that makes Jesus look like a liar. He says he didn't know, but he really does know. I said, uh-uh, not going there. You know, this teaching that I've been given can't be right. Because I will stand on the integrity of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is not a liar. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the truth. 
And so <clears throat> now we got to look further at this. So all of a sudden, this threw me into a quest for the real Jesus. And I got very serious about it. In fact, I got driven. And as I look back now, 30 years later, it amazes me. I mean, I estimate that here I am, a guy with no formal theological education. I read about a thousand volumes on the identity of Jesus. Wow. Just in this quest. And then, of course, I wrote this book. I knew what I was getting into when I gave up the deity of Christ. I knew full well what I was getting into. And it happened at a moment in time. In 1982, I was playing once again in the U.S. Open. Ten years later, after I had a chance to win the thing in, at Pebble Beach in 1972, here I am again in 1982 playing at Pebble Beach in the U.S. Open. And I actually, I shot uh, a very good round on, I believe it was the second round, kind of put me close to contention. Well, guess what? I was once again staying in a private home, and they had a theological library there. Now, I never stayed in a private home very many times in my career. Plus, this is probably the only two times in my life that I stayed in a private home where they had a substantial theological library. Mr. Whitney's house in Augusta and here in Pebble Beach. And I'm reading, I'm just devouring all of this, these commentators' uh, writings in this library, in this home, as soon as I come back to the house from the golf course at Pebble Beach. Because I'm really into this thing. It's been going on for months with me. And so I'm reading these guys on Saturday night, and I'm not going to bed on time either. <laughs> Saturday night, you know, I'm praying constantly about this. At, at actually Sunday morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, I made my decision. No, the Bible does not say that Jesus is God. Right. The Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, we can look at an English version, and some of them will have various different verses that seem to say Jesus is God, or some even, yeah. But no, that, that isn't it. Jesus is not God. Now, I continue the rest of my life to this very day to believe with all of my heart and passion, Jesus was born of a virgin. Miracle. Amen. Amen. Miraculously conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Jesus did miracles. Mm -hmm. Jesus died for my sins on the cross. Amen. And that's why God Amen. forgives me, because I believe in Jesus as my Savior. Yeah. He is my Lord and my Savior. God raised Jesus from the dead, literally. He was seen by the disciples for 40 days, and He ascended then up to heaven, where He sat down at the right hand of God, it tells us many times in the New Testament, especially Acts, Peter preached it, and so forth, uh, which is, uh, comes from Psalm 110.1. Uh, and so Jesus sat down at the right hand of God on God's throne in heaven, exalted, a man. Amen. That's right. And... He's been there, and he's waiting to come back at his second coming when he will bring the great kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament. Yes, amen. He will bring the kingdom of God in all of its glory. It's going to happen. We don't know when, but it's going to happen. Amen. And so God is going to consummate His great plan. He's going to do it through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so I believe this. I always have. No, I don't believe in the deity of Christ. I don't believe that Jesus is God. That's wrong. The Bible doesn't teach that. But hey, at first, I wasn't real sure. Uh, Dr. Michael Brown, both Anthony and I debated him in January. And he asked me right away on his radio program. He says, are you certain Jesus is not God? Michael, I'm absolutely certain. 
But I wasn't certain when I made my decision in 1982. I was about 90% certain. I had two verses that I called obstacles. John 1, 1, C. And the Word was God, as it is traditionally translated. That hung me up. And Thomas, Thomas's confession at the end of the Gospel of John, when Thomas saw the resurrected Jesus, who he said to his disciples, they said, we've seen him. And he says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail prints in his hands and the hole in his heart. And a week later, Jesus appeared to him. And he said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And that has been traditionally understood. It has been traditionally understood that Thomas meant that he was calling Jesus God. I personally don't think that that's what the meaning is supposed to be. I think that when Jesus taught days earlier, and uh, he entered into this conversation with Thomas. And uh, Thomas is, is talking about, show us the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. And, uh, well, just show us the Father. And he said, what? You've been with me all this time. You don't understand? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, Jesus doesn't mean, I am the Father. No, that's not what he means. The one that's Pentecostals, you know, dear people, many of them. Uh, I don't agree. You know? The Bible distinguishes between God and Jesus. They are not the same. And so Jesus meant the Father is in me. God the Father is in Christ. If you go to John 10, he first taught it. When the uh, Jews uh, accused him of claiming to be God. You know, in the Gospel of John, there's a he, he, uh, He's accused of claiming to be God. In chapter 5, verse 18, you know, he healed somebody on the Sabbath, and he called God his Father, and the Jews said, you're calling God his Father, uh, you are making yourself out to be God. Well, now for the rest of the chapter, what is it, about 15 verses or so, I believe that's a complete denial. He completely deny, denies that he's making himself out to be God. He starts out by saying, I can, of my own self, do nothing. He's completely subordinate to the Father. He can't do any miracles apart from the Father's Spirit. He, he can't do anything of substantial work, spiritually, except by His God. That's what He means. And so He completely denies the charge. Then it comes up again in chapter 10, when he says, I am the father of one. And that's just, traditionally has been understood by most traditionalists. I call people who believe Jesus is God traditionalists. Because, of course, you don't have to believe uh, in the Trinity in order to believe that Jesus is God. I would call them Trinitarians, except some of them are not. But I'm talking about people who believe Jesus is God. I call them traditionalists. And most traditionalists teach about that verse that Jesus is saying that he is essentially God, being one with God. Now, I don't think that's what it means. Uh, the context is uh, his work with the Father. You know, the Johanna and Jesus is always talking about the Father gave him his works and gave him his word. And that's why he's called the word of God. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> no, Jesus denies it right there. They picked up stones to stone him to death because... They said, you're making yourself out to be God. And now he denies it. He says, no, he says, I have said, I'm the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, now this, is, now this is very important. Because in Orthodox, Christian orthodoxy, one of the main reasons they say Jesus is God is because the New Testament calls him the Son of God. But see, what happened is that Christianity started out, and it was Jewish. Uh, in this paper I gave out, uh, the first section there, Early Jewish Christianity. Uh, that paper is a portion from my book, except for that first section. That's new. And so, no, the early Jewish Christians did not believe Jesus was God. 
there were two ty there were two types, Ebionites and Nazarenes. And the scholars are really into this right now about early Jewish Christianity because the church fathers who were all Gentiles came along after early Jewish Christianity got started. They changed the gospel. Mm -hmm. they, it's just like uh, Joel Hemphill was saying yesterday. He's exactly right on target. Yeah. Yeah. Many of them were influenced by Greek philosophy. A few of them had been philosophers before they became Christians. So they are very in, uh, influenced by this. And so now the reasoning behind Jesus uh, being God because he's the son of God is based on Greek metaphysics and uh, no it's only relational that's what is meant there God um, Jesus is the son of God relationally to the father and so <clears throat> anyway this uh, quest of mine um, I laid out a plan I said okay number one what does Jesus say about himself I got to look at that Get a red letter Bible. Read all the, the uh, sayings of Jesus. Who does Jesus think he is? What is he saying? Uh, does he ever say he's God? Does he ever say I am God? There's anything like that. Uh, in fact, there isn't anything in the New Testament that says Jesus is God. Nothing like that. And so then I go to the book of Acts. Because, hey, the disciples went out preaching this message. Jesus has now gone to heaven and he sent them out to evangelize the world. And what is their message? Just open up the book of Acts. What did they preach in their evangelistic messages? They preached that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, the Christ. Yeah. They preached that God vindicated, you know, they mean that God vindicated him by raising him from the dead. That proves he's the Messiah. Yes. They also said he's the Son of God. And so these are the things they preached. They never preached that Jesus was God. That's right. In fact, that would be so blasphemous to a Jew mm -hmm. that we wouldn't miss that in the New Testament. You know, there would have been all kinds of arguments. And so, no, there's nothing like that in the New Testament. Uh, they accepted his denials, I believe, those two times in John, because the Sanhedrin interrogated Jesus. You know, in order to try to find fault with him on teaching of the Torah and to get him executed, which they got the job done, they didn't pin anything on him like they wanted to. Now, hey, why didn't those guys back in John 5 and 10 who accused him of claiming to be God, why didn't they come forth and accuse him of claiming to be God? Because he had denied their charge both times. And so, no, there's nothing, the Sanhedrin does not accuse Jesus of claiming to be God. Now, you ask a lot of Christians about this, and they will say, well, yeah, the Sanhedrin condemned Jesus because he claimed to be God. No, that's completely wrong. What happened? The high priest said, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you said it. Henceforth you shall see the Son of Man coming in the right hand of power and great glory. He's referring to Daniel 7.13 and Psalm 110.1. And so, no, he doesn't claim to be God. And the high priest didn't ask him if he claimed to be God. And when he admits that he's the Son of God, that doesn't mean he's God at all. Just go back into the Old Testament and find out what does Son of God mean in the Old Testament. It was applied to angels. It was applied to men, holy men. It was applied to Israel. And that's how the church fathers should have understood it. But they were Gentiles influenced by Greek philosophy. They understood it according to the philosophers. And so John, I, I am completely with Joel Hemphill on, on what he's saying. Amen. Uh, you know, I could go on and on about this, but uh, we're getting a little bit late. Let me, I've got a track called The Real Jesus. Let me just read a few things here. And now I know why I should choose bigger print. <laughs> uh, you know, I have people write and say, ah, your book, the print's too small. <laughs> they say about this too. But anyway, on the back of it at the top, Jesus was visible, but God is invisible. According to John 1, 1-3, verse 18, Timothy 1, 17, Paul writes it. 
Uh, Jesus was approachable, but Paul writes, God dwells in unapproachable light in 1 Timothy 6.16, which you can also look at Psalm 104.2 on that also. Jesus was tempted. The Gospel, all the synoptics tell us about the devil tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And he was tempted other times after that. But God cannot be tempted by evil, James writes in James 1.13. So it makes no sense to say that Jesus is God when he was tempted, when he was approachable, when he was visible, when God is none of those things. Uh, Jesus said on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22.1. That's a psalm written by David. It applies to David's life. It applies to the Messiah. And so Jesus was calling God, my God. Well, the only time he did it, John 20.17, the risen Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. And she, he says, Touch me not, for I have not ascended to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God, go and tell my brethren. And then soon after that, Thomas has a confession about my God, which would be a complete contradiction. You know, if, if Thomas is calling Jesus God, and Jesus has just told Mary Magdalene that the Father is my God, then is Jesus God and he also has a God? No, that doesn't make any sense. Pantocrator. That's only applied to the Father in the New Testament. I believe it's nine times in Revelation. Uh, Jesus says in John 14, 28. What does he say in John 14? Father's, Father's greater, greater than, I. than I. <laughs> He says the Father is greater than I. Uh, so I could go on and on. Look at Paul's salutation. You know, all of them. From my uh, grace, mercy, and peace. From God the Father. For God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. He cons continuously distinguishes between God, whom he calls the Father, because Jesus had called God his Father. That's why the disciples did that. God the Father, he distinguishes from our Lord Jesus Christ. They are not the same. And many times he writes things that shows that it's only God who is the Father. Uh, Ephesians 1.17, three places, four places he does that, totally. There are three, I believe, irrefutable texts in the New Testament that show that Jesus cannot be God because the two main things that stuck out to me in the New Testament are that only the Father is God. There is one God, Echad in the Shema. I believe it means numerically one, as Anthony does, and probably most of you do for all of us. And so there's only one God. Paul writes about it several times. He probably is thinking of the Shema when he does it. And so, who is that one God? It is the Father. There isn't any Trinity. You know, three members of Godhead. That's all made up stuff. <laughs> and it's God, who, it's the Father who is God. Jesus is not God. And so those verses are number one for me. What page? I'm sorry. What page are we on? This is on page two on my paper, uh, Does the Bible Identify Jesus as God? Six-page paper. And in uh, that verse, Jesus is praying to the Father at the beginning of His high priestly prayer uh, after the Last Supper that evening. And He prays to the Father he addresses the Father in verse 1, and then he says in verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, John 5, 44 is much the same way. Jesus had already said, I have come in my Father's name. And then right after he says, of the Father, the one who alone is God. Now, when you bring up about this text, John 17, 3, to traditionalists, they often will talk about verse 5, in which Jesus says to the Father, uh, give me the glory that I had with you before the world was. Does that indicate Jesus pre-existed? Because when I said that I made my decision in 1982, no, Jesus is not God, the Bible doesn't say that, there were two texts that hung me up, 
those two, John 1.1, 1, 1, C, and 20.28, I read Harner on John 1.1, 1, 1, C, in his article in Journal of Biblical Literature that was a response to E.C. Colwell's article 40 years prior in that prestigious journal, has to do with the Northrus nouns, gets very complicated, don't have time to talk about it, but that's what influenced me. So that Harner is right, John 1.1c 1, 1, is not saying that the Word is God, and therefore in verse 14 where it says the Word took flesh, that means Jesus, uh, put the two together, it doesn't mean that the Word is God, but the New English Bible translation has it more correctly. What God was, the Word was. Just as the writer of Hebrews says in his prologue that Jesus is the exact representation of God. And that's what Jesus meant in the Gospel of John. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The prologue links to text in the body of the Gospel. And so the third clause in the first verse, that links to places like where Jesus says, I and the Father are, uh, are one. The Father's in me, I'm in the Father. And uh, so then the next two verses, the irrefutable, are in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4 and 6. There is no God but one. Once again, probably think of the Shema. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. He says plainly, there's only one God, and it's the Father. And yet traditionalists will use this verse to support their view that Jesus pre-existed because it says, by whom are all things, suggesting that Jesus pre-existed and that He created the world. No, that's not what's meant. By means like through. God does everything through Messiah Jesus because He's already decided before He ever created the universe that this Messiah was going to be preeminent. That's what the firstborn means in Revelation and so forth. That Jesus is going to be the head as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11. God is the head of Christ. But Jesus is the head of the church. And then we have in Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all. That, incidentally, we could think of Romans 9, 5. I don't even have time to get into the so-called problem text. And, uh, but you can read the rest of it and see that I've quoted scholars who talk about the scarcity of biblical text that the traditionalists have when they go to scan, you know, scan through the Bible and find texts that support their view that Jesus is God or the doctrine of the Trinity. There are very few texts. It's amazing. And even these traditionalists often admit it. There's such a scarcity of texts. How many are there? Well, it's interesting. The most distinguished scholars that wrote on whether Jesus is God during the 20th century, all of them have their different opinions. Which, you know, how many texts say that Jesus is Theos in the New Testament? Greek New Testament. Uh, the most that they'll say is nine. And some of them will say, no, nah, it's like six, five, three, Boltman comes down to one, and Vincent Taylor agrees with him, and uh, we're talking about some great minds here on what the Bible says. But anyway, so I go into that, and then I show the verses, and what are they? They're John 1.1c, 1, 1, John 1.18, which is a, has a textual problem. Look at this on page 5. Uh, a table I got. Uh, Romans 9.5, 2 Thessalonians 1.12. These are the verses that they use to try to prove that the Bible says that Jesus is God. Titus 2.13, Hebrews 1.8, uh, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and 1 John 5.12. The interesting thing about it is when I started into this quest, I saw that, why my goodness, 
there aren't very many texts that they can point to, and then come to find out there's all kinds of problems with them. Grammatical texts, often it's only like two or three words. It's a small piece. None of them are in a, a portion of scripture where they're identifying Jesus, except for maybe John 1, 1c. And so we have all these statements that are just amazing. Let's turn to the last page, uh, page six. Uh, and I'll just read the top paragraph. Likewise, the categories in which these theos texts, theos means God. You know, traditionalists say they identify Jesus as God. These theos texts do not appear as significant as well. They are not in any of the following New Testament material. The gospel saying of Jesus, the evangelistic speeches recorded in the book of Acts, Descriptive information about what the apostles preach. Definitions of the gospel. Look at Paul. He defines the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. The gospel, here's the gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. What's the good news about? Jesus. He rose from the dead. He's the Messiah. And so how does Paul define the gospel? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scriptures? That's the Old Testament for them. And he was buried. And God raised him from the dead according to the Scriptures. So it was even prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus was going to be raised from the dead. And I believe it's prophesied that he'd be raised on the third day. Which Jesus started to tell his disciples toward the end of his ministry. And then uh, number five. An author's didactic exposition in which he seeks to establish Jesus' identity. None of these passages are in any of this kind of material. I think this is a huge red flag that every Christian should uh, realize and therefore take a serious look. Does the Bible say that Jesus is God or not? I came to the view that He is not God. I knew what I was getting into. I knew I was going to lose so many of my Christian friends, which I did. If I talked to him about it, I lost half of my closest Christian friends about this. I had Christian ministry for 25 years. I've had no Christian ministry for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. except I write Christian books. Mm -hmm. So I've suffered for this. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe I'm taking the, the faithful stand for Christ. Amen. 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 I think the Michael Chavez would be so pleased after you're carrying on both his name and his work, and it's wonderful. I look forward to hearing.